Oh, see ya. Each while, me sub kutwilam tana tamo, anta weinuk, tamanas a satquia, kwatlin tai, tanitsan a kwatlin. In the language of the land, the language of the heart, I said, How are you? Uh, welcome to the land and territory. Um, my name is Weinuk. I am the son of Sathquia. Uh, this is Kwantlen, and I am from Kwantlen First Nation. It's always nice to do an introduction, a welcoming to uh, the land in an indigenous language, downriver dialect. Uh, the, where I'm from in uh, Fort Langley, BC, we speak uh, uh, Hunkaminam, which is the downriver dialect. So as members of the area, it's always nice to uh, welcome people to the area, although it's not the case right now online, but um, it's nice to welcome them in the language as compared to our friends or allies and advocates, they will acknowledge unceded lands. So that's usually for um, for others to do it. I don't necessarily, I will never acknowledge unceded land. Um, because I know where I'm from and I know my name. And that's not usually uh, always the case for uh, some people, um, many people especially indigenous people uh, or people who have been displaced uh, for a variety of traumatic reasons. Um, but knowing where you're from and what your name is is, uh, is how indigenous people can show their prestige and status and uh, wealth. Not within their wallet, but within their knowledge of their culture or um, being with their family, being with their loved ones. Um, so it doesn't really matter if you live here in Vancouver or in the difficult areas like uh, Attawapiskat, where they struggle all the time. Indigenous people will always be here. They will always stay here. And uh, they will continue to be very resilient and strong even during the most difficult times, like right now, a pandemic. Uh, this wouldn't be Kwantlen's first pandemic um, or their first difficult situation. Kwantlen is located in uh, Fort Langley here in BC, uh, which is about 45 minutes east of uh, Vancouver. And uh, they call it the birthplace of British Columbia because that's where uh, Hudson Bay Company was created, um, right across the river from us. So um, Talalam's Ah uh, Wainuk, the house of Wainuk. This is where I'm, where I live right now. I can outside my front door. I can see the fort, literally from my front porch, and that's where. Fort Langley was created based on our trading with the Hudson Bay Company. Um, and uh, they were, amongst others, were pretty much responsible for the decimation of our culture and our people and our, just us being introduced to new illnesses and new um, and new policies and protocols from uh, the settlers over here. So, which is kind of ironic because I was reading about how Hudson Bay is struggling downtown Vancouver and how it's not looking too good for them during a pandemic, which I find is a little ironic. But uh, I'm sure they will get through their difficult moments, just like Kwantlen. Um, so my mother is an elder here at Kwantlen. She's 78 years old. She attended three Indian residential schools, Cooper Island, K-U-P-E-R, um, and Sea Shelt and St. Mary's. 
So she spent nine years away from Indian residential schools and uh, as a result has faced a lot of uh, historical and generational trauma that has continued to impact our community and uh, our family. Um, her name is Sakuya, Sakuya, which means uh, she who always remembers. My name is Wainuk, uh, which means a man of sound, which was uh, gifted to me five years ago in, in our longhouse. Uh, it was earned based on my uh, background in music uh, and my insatiable appetite for collecting music. As you can see in the background, um, it's just a small part of my collection. These are probably the most recent purchases uh, I've made over the years. Um, probably numbered in at over, I think the last record I catalog was 3,089. Um, so I love music so much. And that's what I'm kind of here to talk to you today about is uh, is music coming from the man of sound way nook um, and it just shows how resilient and strong and uh, transforming it could be like a psychedelic transcending experience is what music can be like um, it can be uh, a way to survive uh, during difficult times. And it's something that the indigenous people of, uh, have been doing for over 20,000 years. Um, I know Native people and our friends from Africa, when they left the shores and they left the water of their areas to be displaced, um, to lose their name and to lose where they are from, to lose their songs and to be uh, dis disassociated with with those around them. Uh, they were also responsible, the native people and our African friends were responsible for the creation of a lot of popular music today that we know and love but it's also something that Native people have been doing for over 20,000 years. So Native people have contributed to the uh, contributions and beginnings and origins of popular music that we listen to today. And that's how uh, you created a country, just like how Hudson Bay Company set up literally from my front porch. I can see them there. Um, and it's an experience where it has helped us survive, uh, to stay strong. Quam Quam. Quam Quam is strong. Not with like physical strength, but like mentality and uh, uh, just mental strength. So that's like my mother. My mother is 78. She was at 70 pounds and had hip replacement surgery. But, um, yeah, it takes a lot of mental strength to go through that, especially during a pandemic. And, you know, I've been there with her too. So Quam Quam is strength, not physical, but mental. And that's when I looked to um, when the settlers came. I know uh, they're just getting ready for American Thanksgiving. Uh, I also have American heritage too, so I'm dual citizen, just based on the fact that my grandfather walked from uh, Deming, Washington. Um, there was no borders then, so he would walk across and he settled here in Fort Langley, and that's where he created our family. Uh, so I do have American citizenship and can Canadian citizenship, but I was born here in Canada, in Ottawa. So that's um, when you look at the settlers who would come and, uh, you know, their main goal and main interest was to displace uh, people to make sure that they're not able to claim anything in the future or not knowing where they are from. Um, 
when you take that away from someone, that's just continued battles, continued struggles, and knowing that they can, they will always be uh, disenfranchised or never be able to be part of the same table that is for them, because it's not they don't know where they're from. Um, so when the settlers would go to war with the native men. Uh, the native men would be able to, um, you know, bring themselves into such a, a psychedelic experience, um, a psychedelic uh, transformation where they felt they were invincible and uh, able to defeat anything that was put in front of them, um, which would be very scary and... Uh, um, I'm sure it'd be traumatizing for those on the other side, those with the guns. So they would shoot them. They would shoot the native men, but the native men were able to withhold it and stand up against those who were oppressing them and cry and scream and yell and still be able to go to war over, over what was going on. And even though the native people didn't have guns or bullets, they were still able to, uh, you know, do very well in the wars with the settlers. And um, what we were doing was something that was part of our practice and culture, and we still do it today, especially around this time of the year. Um, they were crying, they were singing, they were screaming, and they felt like they could transform into whatever they needed to do to survive. And over here, that's what we call uh, the winter dance. It's like a um, personal, very personal experience for the families of that indigenous community, or a very personal experience for indigenous communities close by that can come together and share through song and dance, through drumming and singing. Um, and songs that would come from the river, like it's in the picture right now. All of us would live alongside the shoreline of the river. That's how we lived off the land. We were very healthy. We were very, um, lived off the land resources. Uh, we didn't use a financial system. It was a lot of sharing. Um, so what we saw from the get-go, um, was uh, what we would what would be called later be called the creation of blues music blues music we were singing the blues about being oppressed um, being you know uh, killed being murdered it's something that we can still do today in the longhouse uh, the winter dance and like I said, uh, it's more on a, like a need-to-know basis. It's very personal. It's our form of uh, healing and uh, rehabilitation. Uh, but through song and dance and culture and food and being with our elders and showing our elders that we can still do this work and we know how to do this work and that we can do this work. Um, so that's how Native people would do their teachings. But these are songs that we've been singing for, you know, since time immemorial, since the first, you know, sunrise and the first sunset. Um, is singing the blues. But when the settlers would see that these Native men wouldn't be able to die as quickly as they thought, they went to Plan B. And plan B was to take the boats to the shores of Africa and um, take these men, displace them, take the black men and bring them to America, and bring them to the shoreline, take them away from there. And that's how they would create America. So they would have uh, displaced the black men, bring them to America from boats and create them as slaves. And then they said, we are going, since we can't kill off the native men, we need to, we need to uh, displace them 
and we'll displace them all around Canada, all around America, what was later to be known as Canada, displace them in Mexico and other areas where boats can take them. And then um, residential schools were set up and other um, uh, genocidal tactics that would pretty much uh, decimate our families and our culture and our way of thinking. I know the Kualin, we used to be one of the strongest indigenous groups in the lower mainland. We numbered at 10,000. But after that, the lowest we ever reached was 60, 6 zero. And uh, um, right now we're a little over 300. So it takes a lot of work to, to know where you're from and to know what your name is and to not only do that, but to have the, the heart to come home and learn these teachings and uh, be a part of these teachings and just uh, know how to survive. I know Native people are very good at knowing how to survive. Um, we use our, our teachings, like the seven laws, teachings that have always been here. But I think due to uh, time constraints, uh, that would be uh, something that uh, we would have to look at a, at a further date, maybe. I know that would be Shwa'elis' health, to create breath, to create breath. If we're breathing, then that's a good thing, that's okay. If we're breathing, we can work from there. We can work from there to uh, to try to live a healthy lifestyle or uh, look at other supports that can help us live a healthier lifestyle. To create breath is Shwa'ela. That's one of our seven laws, health. Um, and I think that's very important when we think about our African friends too or our friends who come from, uh, uh, you know, a targeted community or who are, you know, a part of a, a system where they're not invited to uh, flourish or eat at the table or be a part of the table um, to create breath. So when we had uh, the Native people and the Black people here, so the Black people stayed around, the Black men stayed around, and they would have children with the native women. The native women stayed here. But when you would have uh, children who are native but are don't look native, um, but will look black, uh, it would just mean that further down the road they would not be able to claim anything. They would not be able to claim their lands or their treaties or a beautiful home like where I'm living right now. Because uh, uh, they would be laughed at. They'd be ridiculed. Uh, saying they don't look native, a black man claiming he's native, you know, uh, it wouldn't work well, especially today. So when you have two groups that are targeted from the get-go, um, um, you know, we had the residential school system, we had uh, uh, slavery, um, we still have, uh, you know, many... Uh, social injustices, especially for our black friends, 401 years. Um, you know, they, they look at how poorly they were treated. But when they would work together, Yai still was working together, they would come together and use their their culture and their, their music and their ways to survive during the most difficult times in their lives. So this mostly happened along the... the, the eastern parts of, of North America, America, um, where you have black people and, and uh, natives come together to uh, create music through drumming and singing and using their, their cultural ways to help them get through. Um, so I know in the one area of America, this is the only area where you could see a black man drum and sing dressed up in feathers. Uh, and it was a, an event, a beautiful, beautiful event that was created uh, a while ago, 150 years ago. 
and that's called Mardi Gras. So there you have native people and uh, black people working together to um, help themselves through music and they created what we know now as jazz music. And then, um, yeah, you can still see the Mardi Gras with the blues and the jazz. Um, uh, in that area, but now you know uh, certain groups, certain uh, uh, festivities have kind of um, you know made it a lot worse. It's not exactly what it was. You have to go to like a very tough looking area in New Orleans to experience the real Mardi Gras, not like what you see on TV. Or um, and that's the only place where you can see a black man dressed up in feathers. So that was a creation of jazz music that helped. Um, and I know, just looking at the time uh, from the jazz music uh, is where uh, the young people in New York City, Brooklyn, Queens, uh, and other boroughs, the Bronx would create hip hop. And how that was brought about too, through sampling and record collecting. The rumble in the Bronx, how they were not treated properly by politicians, uh, you know, the rioting over there, through the gangs, through dance, dance, music, turntables, records. That's how hip hop was started. Graffiti was an art form. Graffiti was an art form to help them just lift up their spirits by watching from the trains. You know, that just hip hop alone could be another you know, half hour talk about that. Maybe that's something we could look into later. But I just wanted to focus on the creation of the of the countries or knowing where you're from and what your name is. Um, looking at how Native people have influenced popular music by singing the blues of the winter dance and how it's a very personal psychedelic experience. I don't know if anyone listening now has been able to be a part of that. But it's, yeah, like I say, it's on a need-to-know basis. And if you ever get an invitation, I would recommend you going because that would probably be the first and only invitation that will take place. Um, I know with COVID restrictions, we can't do it this year. Um, but the fact that we know it is what counts. And I know with uh, my insatiable appetite for record collecting and putting that needle on, you know, my turntable on the record. So putting it on there, there's that bump, the bump, you know, the that's a ritual that never gets old. And I can't get enough of it. So when I put that bump on, it doesn't matter what record it is. It could be records about indigenous people. It could be records about um, jazz. It could be records about hip hop. It could be electronica. It could be gospel. When you put in that, that's that bump of that ritual experience. Like the winter dance. Um, like drumming and singing. It's like a transformational experience of the bump. And sometimes, you know what, we need that bump. You need that bump in life to get through. Maybe it's from a, you know, a friend, a family, your partner, a teacher, a professor. Maybe someone on TV could be through a record. That you need that bump in life to get through, to, uh, to create breath. You know, you want to be able to breathe. And if you can't breathe, and that's what happens. You pass away. And that's what we saw from, you know, George Floyd and, you know, and all the others, so many others that were part of a system where they're not allowed to flourish or be a part of or targeted for being who they are. You know, LGBTQ, Muslim, women, natives. Um, you need that bump in life to uh, be able to to create breath and to 
try to survive. We are surviving. And I know I can look at my mom for that too. Um, we're just really good at surviving. And records are like, it's kind of like a broken of avenue. A, a record could be like a broken avenue of dreams that was once lost. Um, but once you put that record on, bump, bump, you bring that dream back. So thank you so much for listening. I really appreciate it. Have a great day.